We start with a historic mission to the moon and the launch of India's Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft. This is the moment that it took off just under an hour ago. It entered Earth's orbit. By the time India's Chandrayaan-3 touched down near the moon's south pole, anticipation had already reached a fever pitch. It was a symbolic triumph for the country's space program, proof of engineering mastery, and an unmistakable signal of its growing stature among the world's spacefaring nations. Yet the true weight of the mission would not rest on its flawless landing or its demonstration of technical skill. What would make this mission historic was hidden just below the lunar surface, waiting to challenge decades of assumptions. From the moment the Pragyan rover began its slow crawl across the dusty terrain, the region's long-standing reputation as an ideal future site for human settlement began to unravel. Prior orbital data had painted the South Pole as stable, resource-rich, and promising, especially for its stores of water ice. But as the rover's instruments probed beneath the regolith, unexpected patterns emerged. Inconsistencies in mineral composition, erratic thermal behavior, and, most disconcerting of all, bursts of radiation and electromagnetic interference unlike anything measured on the moon before. The readings were not the result of faulty sensors. Every instrument aboard both the Vikram lander and the Pragyan rover had been meticulously tested and recalibrated prior to launch. The anomalies were real, reliable, repeatable, and impossible to reconcile with any current lunar models. Beneath the South Pole's surface lay a layer that baffled scientists. Radar scans showed it as unusually reflective, yet thermal imaging revealed it acted like a heat sponge, absorbing sunlight during the lunar day, but releasing it in patterns that defied all known physical behavior. This raised immediate alarms. Thermal instability at such a scale could severely complicate any future habitation plans. Even more unsettling was what the sensors found deeper still. Between two and three meters below the surface, neutron flux measurements spiked far beyond predictions, with radiation signatures unlike the random chaos of natural decay. The energy pulsed in steady rhythms, cycling over predictable intervals as though regulated by an unseen mechanism. The phenomenon was too structured to be explained by ordinary cosmic rays or solar wind, and it was emanating from beneath the ground, not from space. For those monitoring the mission in ISRO's control center, and for astrophysicists around the globe, this was no mere curiosity. It was a disruption to the foundation of lunar science. The moon's poles had been the centerpiece of countless colonization plans. The con but if they were mixed with or situated above irradiated material, their utility would be sharply limited. And the hazards for crewed missions, especially from intermittent, unpredictable radiation pulses, would be profound. The mission's findings also posed a psychological challenge. The moon has always held a special place in humanity's imagination. The first alien world visited, the first surface walked upon beyond Earth. It was a familiar friend in the sky, a gateway to greater exploration. Now, that image was cracking. If the closest, most studied celestial neighbor could hide dangers this severe, what did that imply about more distant, less understood worlds like Mars or Europa? The rover's mission continued, but the surprises multiplied. Communications with Earth, usually stable and precise, began to falter in certain zones. Signals degraded and recovered in repeating patterns tied to specific coordinates. The landscape in these interference zones appeared utterly ordinary. No craters, no unusual rock formations, yet something in the subsurface blocked or distorted transmissions. On Earth, similar effects can be traced to magnetic ore deposits or tectonic shifts, but the moon's south pole was expected to be magnetically quiet. This made the interference deeply puzzling and potentially dangerous for future communication networks. The timing of these revelations complicated matters further. International interest in the South Pole had never been higher. NASA's Artemis program was charted crewed landings there. China was preparing its own polar missions. SpaceX, Blue Origin, and other private firms had ambitions to mine resources and establish outposts. Many saw this region as the future heart of lunar industry. But Chandrayaan-3's data cast long shadows over these plans, hinting that the moon's most sought-after real estate might be riddled with hidden hazards. Though there was no direct evidence pointing toward any artificial structures, the patterns of radiation and interference revived discussions once dismissed as fringe speculation. Could the moon's crust be concealing unusual geological formations, or even remnants of past processes, buried deep enough to escape detection until now? Such theories remained unproven, 
But the data underscored one undeniable fact. The moon was far stranger and less predictable than the serene static sphere long depicted in textbooks. Further analysis revealed that the anomalies were confined to sharply defined pockets, rather than spread randomly across the region. These hot zones suggested something systemic at work beneath the Thermal mapping identified areas where material properties shifted subtly with the changing angle of sunlight, a behavior unknown in ordinary lunar soil. In these spots, regolith appeared to adapt its heat retention as lighting conditions changed, hinting at a complex molecular or structural composition. What baffled scientists even more was the lack of any surface markers indicating these anomalies. To the naked eye, the ground in these zones looked no different from the surrounding dust and rock. This invisibility meant such hazards could be easily overlooked in pre-landing surveys, a risk with potentially catastrophic consequences for both robotic and human missions. The South Pole had been thought of as a time capsule of the solar system's early history, its permanently shadowed craters preserving ice and volatile materials from billions of years ago. Chandrayaan 3's discoveries hinted at something far more dynamic. The data raised the possibility that the moon might not be geologically dead after all. While it might not experience tectonic plate movements like Earth, there could be pockets of localized activity, thermal surges, particle emissions, or exotic mineral reactions, occurring right now beneath its crust. If true, the implications for colonization were profound. Infrastructure designed for stable conditions could face unexpected degradation or outright failure. Radiation spikes could occur without warning. The ground beneath habitats could prove unstable in ways invisible from orbit. For astronauts, even short-term exposure to such unpredictable hazards would demand entirely new safety protocols. The engineering challenges extended beyond human safety. Robotic explorers and mining equipment rely on predictable environmental conditions to function effectively. A miscalculation caused by invisible radiation pieces or shifting thermal properties could destroy sensitive hardware or corrupt mission-critical data. This made resilience in design, especially for autonomous systems, a necessity rather than a luxury. Meanwhile, the geopolitical calculus of lunar exploration was changing in real time. Control of the South Pole was no longer just a matter of planting a flag first. It was becoming a race to understand the anomalies before others. In an arena where knowledge equates to strategic advantage, nations unwilling or unable to invest in high-resolution mapping and in-depth analysis risked being sidelined in the next phase of space development. The legal questions were equally thorny. International treaties governing space exploration assumed celestial bodies were inert and neutral unchanging landscapes where only the vacuum of space posed hazards. There was no precedent for regulating their use. Disputes could easily arise if, for example, one country's base sat atop an anomaly that disrupted another's operations. The Chandrayaan-3 mission also rekindled interest in unconventional theories about the moon's interior. Not because such theories had been proven correct, but because the available data failed to produce satisfying explanations through conventional means. Whether these anomalies were the result of rare natural processes or something less ordinary, the need for deeper investigation was clear. Plans for follow-up missions began forming almost immediately. Unlike broad-ranging survey rovers, these proposed expeditions would focus exclusively on the anomaly zones. Deep drilling landers equipped with advanced particle detectors and radiation-hardened instruments were envisioned, machines built to probe straight down, through the heat-absorbing crust and into the mysterious layers below. The goal? Identify the true source of the emissions and determine whether the cause was geological, chemical, or something entirely outside current models. This shift in mission design marked a significant break from decades of exploration strategy. For much of the space age, surface mobility and panoramic imaging had been the gold standard for lunar science. Now, Chandrayaan-3 was making it clear that the answers lay below, hidden from orbital view, in depths that no human or machine had yet penetrated. The urgency to act was heightened by a lingering uncertainty. No one knew whether the anomalies were stable, fading, or intensifying. If radiation pulses grew stronger or thermal behavior became more erratic, the risks to future missions would only increase. The clock was ticking, not just to explore, but to understand before conditions changed beyond recognition. The world's response to Chandrayaan 3's revelations was as fragmented as it was intense. In the weeks following the initial data release, space agencies, independent researchers, 
and private corporations rushed to download the mission's publicly available telemetry. Online forums that had once debated minor details of rocket staging or rover wheel designs now buzzed with speculation over the pulse, as the rhythmic radiation bursts were being called. For India's ISRO, the choice to publish raw, unfiltered data was a strategic gamble. On one hand, it projected transparency, underscoring the mission's scientific credibility. On the other hand, it meant that rival nations and commercial competitors had immediate access to the same anomaly readings, data that could inform their own. NASA issued a carefully worded statement praising ISRO's achievement while noting that further investigation was required to determine the nature of the anomalies. Behind closed doors, mission planners convened emergency workshops, re-evaluating crewed landing coordinates and habitat designs. The possibility that an Artemis base might unknowingly be constructed atop a hot zone was unacceptable. Any shift in landing sites, however, would cascade through years of logistical planning, cargo manifests, and budget allocations. China's National Space Administration, CNSA, took a more assertive stance. State media highlighted Chandrayaan-3's discoveries as evidence that the moon remained a frontier requiring vigilant study, hinting at the need for sovereign access to critical polar regions. Though they did not directly challenge ISRO's findings, the tone suggested a readiness to act independently of international consensus. Observers noted an uptick in CNSA's South Pole reconnaissance satellites, their orbits subtly adjusted to gather higher resolution readings over coordinates linked to the Indian rover's interference zones. Private industry, too, was quick to pivot. Mining startups that had courted investors with visions of extracting water ice from shadowed craters began inserting new cautionary disclaimers into their prospectuses. Venture capital enthusiasm cooled slightly, not from lack of interest in lunar resources, but from uncertainty about the cost of mitigating unknown hazards. A single overlooked anomaly could wipe out millions of dollars in equipment, insurance, and lost contracts. Meanwhile, the Chandrayaan-3 science team found themselves under constant pressure to interpret their findings, pressure compounded by the fact that many results simply defied explanation. Thermal readings from the anomaly zones continued to follow no known model, shifting in ways that suggested a material capable of responding to both direct sunlight and indirect scattered light from the surrounding terrain. This adaptive behavior raised a troubling question. Could these subsurface layers be undergoing active, energy-driven processes even now? If so, the moon's interior might be far from inert. The prevailing scientific narrative, that the moon had been geologically dead for over a billion years, was suddenly in jeopardy. Some researchers proposed exotic explanations, including slow, localized chemical reactions between buried ice and metallic minerals, releasing energy in intermittent bursts. Others floated theories of deep crustal heating driven by residual tidal forces, though no existing model could account for the precise rhythms observed. Perhaps most monitoring. A base built during a quiet phase could, decades later, find itself bathed in radiation from a newly awakened zone. The geopolitical stakes rose further when an unverified leak, allegedly from an internal ISRO engineering memo, claimed that some radiation bursts had been accompanied by minute but measurable tremors beneath the regolith. While well below the threshold of a moonquake, such vibrations hinted at mechanical movement underground. If true, it meant that whatever was producing the anomalies was not purely electromagnetic in nature. There was a physical component as well. This revelation, though unconfirmed, was enough to ignite another wave of speculation. Some saw it as evidence of cryovolcanic activity, an almost heretical suggestion for the moon. Others, more dramatically, suggested the possibility of buried structures, natural or otherwise, shifting subtly over time. For the scientific community, the line between plausible and speculative was wearing thin. Without more data, both camps were operating in the dark. International law experts began warning of an impending, lunar sovereignty crisis. If a nation claimed an anomaly zone as part of its operational territory under the guise of safety research, would that grant it de facto control over adjacent resource-rich areas? The Outer Space Treaty, drafted in 1967, offered no practical mechanism to resolve such disputes beyond vague language about the benefit of all mankind. The moon, once a symbol of shared human aspiration, was edging toward becoming a chessboard of strategic exclusion zones. Back in the ISRO mission control archives, raw sensor data kept pouring in. The Pryan rover's instruments had been scheduled for extended operation, even beyond its nominal mission timeline. 
Yet engineers faced a difficult decision. Keep the rover within safe zones to preserve its lifespan, or risk driving it deeper into anomaly regions for more precise readings. The latter promised potentially groundbreaking science, but carried the real danger of instrument failure from unexpected radiation surges or thermal stress. Ultimately, the decision was made to push further. On its 37th lunar day, Prion ventured toward one of the most intense hot zones identified so far. Almost immediately, telemetry indicated rising interference levels. The rover's cameras continued to function, but subtle glitches began appearing in spectrometer readings. Data packets arrived garbled, then cleared without explanation, as though some invisible field were flexing around the rover. The most dramatic finding stacked like the bands of a composite material. To mission scientists, the implication was extraordinary. These layers were too regular to be the product of random deposition. Nature could produce banded rock formations, yes, but not with the precision and uniformity indicated by the radar data. In the weeks that followed, Debates raged within ISRO and the broader scientific community. The cautious majority leaned toward an as-yet-unknown natural process, perhaps linked to cycles of freeze-thaw interactions with buried volatiles. A smaller, more adventurous contingent argued that the data hinted at an origin outside purely geological explanations. Neither side had definitive proof, and without the ability to physically drill into the anomaly, both remained speculative. The public, meanwhile, was captivated. Media outlets seized on every new fragment of information, from the rover's fluctuating telemetry to orbital flyover images of the featureless ground above the anomalies. Talk shows featured astrophysicists and science fiction authors side by side, blurring the line between evidence and imagination. The moon was no longer a static relic. It was alive in the public consciousness again, mysterious and unpredictable. India's leadership, keenly aware of the cultural and political weight of Chandrayaan 3's mission, began framing the anomalies as an opportunity rather than a setback. In speeches, officials described them as gateways to knowledge and a reminder that exploration always surprises us. Behind the rhetoric, however, budget proposals were being drafted for a follow-up mission, one equipped not just for surface exploration, but for deep subsurface drilling and long-term monitoring. In an era where most space missions are judged by how well they stick to pre-planned goals, Chandrayaan 3's greatest achievement was in upending expectations. Its findings forced every spacefaring nation to reconsider what they thought they knew about the moon's most promising region. This is only the beginning. If you want to follow the unfolding mystery, join the conversation, and be part of the journey to uncover the truth, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. The next revelation could change everything we thought we knew about the moon, and you won't want to miss it.